Hello, everyone. Welcome to our presentation at Black Hat Europe. Today, our topic is the Art of Exporting User Free by written to BPF in Android kernel. Uh, here's the agenda. We will introduce the internals of the affected kernel module in the Android kernel, kernel including the past vulnerabilities, and then analyze the user free bug CVE 2021-0399. We will later talk about how to exploit the vulnerability on a modern Android device, including a demo video. Uh, moreover, I will talk about another user free bug found uh, in this kernel module while I'm writing the POC. Richard will talk about Android kernel mitigations and how Google detects as actually code at scale by various approaches. Cool. So uh, let's take a look at the affected Android kernel module, XT underscore QTHEID. The module is mainly used for tracking the network traffic on a per circuit basis for a unique app since Android 3. It is replaced by eBPF since Android Q. So only Android Pi and lower versions are affected. And basically how it works is that a user space program may send command data to the kernel module, such as asking kernel to tag a socket or untag socket. Uh, tag a socket basically means we want the Android kernel to track the specific socket file descriptor and provide network data usage information back to the user space. And you can tag with the kernel module by ADB, or you may use Android APIs like traffic status. Um, cool. Now I will introduce three different uh, scenarios over the module, tag a socket and untag socket. Um, when user space program open the kernel module, the module will allocate two different structures in respect of per UID and PID. And as you can see, there will be only one unique UID tag data structure, but there might be multiple proxy data structures for every PID, which are essentially linked to the UID tag data structure. And when a user space program tags a socket, it has to provide all sorts of information, such as the socket file description, user ID, etc. And two different data structures will be allocated in terms of the UID and the PID. So first of all, the model will find the corresponding uh, UID tag data structure from UID tag data tree, which is a global variable. Allocate structure tag ref and initialize the tag and the reference count. And also following the similar pattern, the kernel will find proc Q2 data from a global variable and allocate a structure called soc tag. And different soc tag structures are linked together. Uh, as you can see, please remember the soc tag structure because later we will see a user free happens here. Cool. So here is the overview of all the related kernel data structures while the socket is tagged. And as we mentioned in the last slide, the model will create tag ref structure and sub tag structures. So um, when a socket is untagged, the reference count in the tag ref is decreased. And sub tag is unlinked from the linked list and free later. You may also imagine the basic idea of how cleanup works when a user decides to cross the module is that all the related socket tag and proxy data structure will be unlinked and freed. Cool. So since the module was introduced in Android since 2011, there were two vulnerabilities reported to Google in the past. So the first bug is CV 2016 3.8.09. This one is pretty well known. It's a very, very important kernel information leak issue for leaking the kernel SOC address. You may just read the pseudo file system, and the raw pointer is written to the user space. It helps a lot of exploit to make them more stable and easier to exploit the kernel, such as the pinball exploit. The root cause is pretty obvious that because the format string is not applied properly, so a novel user may, might be able to read the raw pointer address. Cool. Uh, the other one is a user free on tag wrap tree by risk condition due to improper locking. So as you can see from 2011 to 2020, there are only two vulnerabilities in this module. And the module got replaced since Android Q by eBPL. So what can possibly go wrong in 2021? Um, the, bug was reported by the external researcher earlier this year saying that there is a potential user free 
under certain conditions. No proof of concept or exploitation details provided, but researchers believe it's impossible to exploit our modern devices because of the hardware level mitigation, user access override, which is enabled on kernel 4.14 by default. And usually an engine exploit will choose to temper the address limit, so the exploit can use type syscall to do actually kernel of read and write. There are a lot of ways to um, temper the address limit. Like for instance, you may set up a ROP or jump to several well-known kernel functions and the kernel is happy to override the address limit for you. Uh, but with the user access override mitigation, it's not likely to exploit the kernel in this way. And that's why external researchers believe the vulnerability might not be able to exploit on modern devices. And thus, the Google and Jessica team decided to investigate the likelihood of exploitation of this vulnerability and see if it still works on modern devices. Uh, therefore, when the bug was reported to Google, Richard quickly wrote a minimal POC for kernel crash. It's very simple. As you can see, uh, tag a socket, and then untag the socket from a chart process, exit the program, and kernel crash. So how is it possible? Let's take a close look at how untag socket actually works. Because when a uh, user space program opens the module, as we said before, the model will create procedure data structure by PID. So uh, first of all, the kernel model tries to find the corresponding procedure data structure based on PID. Then unlinks the sub tag structure and free it. However, as you can see, there is a starting check. It says like if the um, procedure data structure is not found by PID, the model will complain without doing anything. But the socket tag structure will still get free later. So we have a free socket tag structure resides in the um, socket tag linked list. Cool. So the next step is about how to exploit this vulnerability. So uh, let's see how to exploit this, this vulnerability to modern uh, Android Pi device, which had the address limit check, user access override, slash free list random and hardened mitigations. And later, I will show a video on how to exploit Xiaomi Mi 9 device with the latest kernel version 4.14 for Android Pi with the aforementioned mitigations. Cool. Um, so first of all, if you are not very familiar with Android kernel exploitations, most Android devices nowadays use kmalloc 128 as the minimal size of the step object. So the size of the object allocated by kmalloc is actually 128 bytes. The first kind of syscall we want to abuse is eventfd. So as you can see, the member count overlaps the least head in the sock text structure. The idea for doing kernel heap leak is that um, when sock tag is already free, spread eventfd to make sure an eventfd structure occupies the free uh, sock text structure. And now you can see two sock tag structure linked it together. And the left side is bridged by uh, event FD. Cool. And then we untag the sock tag structure on the right side. So the unlink primitive will override count to the address of the list head. And then we can read the pseudo file system to get the count from the event MD. So we can. Uh, leak kernel heap addresses, and later turn this into a special kernel double free. So um, a naive idea for getting double free in this case is that um, you may export this user free vulnerability and probably crop to uh, same sub tag structure. So kernel might be able to like release a sub structure twice. But essentially the kernel model also has to like unlink the sub tag structure and free them later. So what happens if we have uh, two identical sub tag structures or the sub tag structure has the invalid tag? Obviously, it kind of will crash because there are several uh, security checks in the cleanup code. So for example, if we crop a sub structure with invalid tag, the kernel crashes because the corresponding uh, tag ref structure does not exist. And if we create two identical subtext structure, 
the reference count will become invalid, so kind of will crash too. Therefore, uh, in order to bypass all the security checks, uh, here is the way I figure out. So first of all, uh, on tag, the sock tag B structure by a child process. So we have a, a user free first, okay? And then we spray event FD to occupy the sock tag B structure. And then on tag, the socket tag structure C. So the unlink primitive will help us leak the address of the sock tag, tag C, okay? And similarly, you may leak the list head address as we mentioned earlier. And there are also the sock tag structure E, F, and G in the link list, but we will talk about them later. So uh, now in order to bypass the security checks, we have to spray the first two objects and do tag impersonation. Okay, so the original tag are B and D, and now we override, override the tag to um, E and F, and then override the next list to the list header node. So we actually unlink the sub tag structure E, F, G from the link list, and the model cleanup code will never see them on the uh, sub tag link list. We may also have to free these two crafted objects because the first eight bytes of the object must be a valid address for RBE race operation. Okay, so uh, in this way, we may free the crafted circuit tag structures without triggering any kernel checks. We will later use this primitive for performing a um, special double free. Okay, and by the way, for devices are still vulnerable to CV 2016 3809. Exporting the kernel might be much easier uh, because we can abuse the subput from the module cleanup code and craft a corrupted kernel sub structure. Okay, and uh, if you check the size of the sub tag structure, it's 64 bytes. So luckily, a 128 byte slab object can host two sub tag structure, and thus we may impersonate the tag G and craft another sub tag structure in the same slab object. And when the module is doing a uh, cleanup, the, model, the kernel module will free the uh, suck tag and free the suck tag in the middle consequently, which will help us the kernel SRA by this special kernel dot free. And uh, to the kernel SRA, we may consider, consider spring the slab at the beginning of the exploit in this following way and keep opening the proc CPU info for asking the kernel allocating tons of sequence file uh, structures. Because of the double free, these sequence file structures are likely to overlap each other in this case. Okay. The overlap the event FD and sequence file leads to a very interesting result is that the count from the event FD now becomes a sequence operation. And luckily the spin log from the event FD context just works because it overlaps the spin log from the sequence file structure so we can uh, easily leak kernel SR. And if the slab free list is not hardened, you may also abuse double free primitive to do kernel space memory attack. But unfortunately, the mitigation is enabled in midnight device, so abusing the double free primitive directly is not very possible. Um, there are also other candidates, such as escape underscore put, where you may control the uh, soft gesture it might be possible to use this primitive to disable SNLX and kernel pointer restriction. Um, but my approach is to override the sequence operation because sequence operation contains several kernel function pointers. So tempering the sequence operation might be a key interest for us. So um, let's take a look at event FD again. Not only can you uh, use event FD to leak kernel information, we can also write data to the event of the file disclosure and override the count. So in this case, we can control the count from the um, event FD, which is equivalent to overwriting the sequence operation. But since we have a lot of file descriptor over the CPU info, how can we find the file descriptor of the overlapped sequence, or, uh, sequence file object? Um, my solution is to override the sequence operation from CPU info op to console op and read the data from every file descriptor so we can find uh, 
the corresponding file description. And as we mentioned before, now the challenge is to uh, corrupt a sequence operation to control kernel IP and perform an escalation of privilege. We might need to spray a sequence file again in order to ask kernel to use the corrupted sequence operation correctly. And if user access override is not enabled, we may use the rub gadget on the uh, kernel get soft property function to gracefully temper the address limit. But unfortunately, it doesn't work on uh, 4.14 kernel. Uh, the kernel will check the address limit during every syscalls, and kernel enables hardware level mitigation user access override. So we have to find um, another way to properly fill the rub gadget. Um, as mentioned by Project Zero, we can uh, invoke BPF program as the ultimate rub. Uh, if the second argument is the address of the BPF instructions, then kernel is very happy to execute arbitrary BPF instructions without verification. Thus, we can use this uh, ultimate rub to do the local escalation of privilege. And as a consequence, you can get an arbitrary kernel read and write primitive. For in instance, you may disable kernel pointer restrict and SA Linux. Um, and also, uh, you, can, you, you can hammer the um, SOC SKPOCRAT by executing arbitrary BPF instructions and finally get a root shell. You can put the BPF instructions in a slab 128 bytes object because these BPF instructions are just 128 bytes. Okay, cool. So here is the uh, video demo video about um, Punch Midnight device in 10 seconds. So now we have a Russia. One more thing about this kernel module is that I found another user-free vulnerability when writing the POC. Uh, it's basically a race condition. So when CPU zero gets the lock, retrieve an object from queue, re release the lock, and read the tag from the object. Uh, however, another CPU may grab the lock, free the object, and, um, and uh, drop the lock. So uh, unprivileged applications may talk to uh, that was status manager in a very um, conventional way and leak kernel information. It's probably going to take some time for leaking kernel information, but it works. So the patch is to make sure the object read operation is also protected by the lock. So the summary of X14 uh, CV2021-0399 is that first of all, we have to get a special kernel of free primitive and the overlapped event FD and sequence file structures can hijack the control flow by crafting sequence operations by writing to the event FD descriptor. And also by reading the event FD file descriptor, we can leak kernel information. Also, if user access override mitigation is enabled, return to BPF might be your new friends. And now please welcome Richard Neil for the rest of the presentation about defensive side. Now that Xing Yu has explained the exploitation, I'll look at some of the mitigations making this more difficult or impossible, and then review some of our defensive systems that help us find malicious software. Starting with kernel mitigations, the first one is a compilation setting affecting pointers in the free lists maintained by memory management. Added in Linux 4.14 in November 2017, config slab free list hardened XORs the free list pointer in slub caches with a per cache random value. This makes exploiting free list pointer overwrites more difficult, as unless the attacker also knows the XOR value, they don't get control of the memory address. This can be bypassed using the signal FD technique shown on the slide and described earlier. Spraying signal FD context structures allows a mostly user specified value to be set via the mask argument. I say mostly because two additional bits are set in the value written, so the attacker doesn't have complete control over it, but detection of the list corruption can be avoided. 
Kernel Electric Fence is a low overhead sampling based memory safety error detector added to Linux in 2020. It detects out of bounds heap access, use after free and invalid free errors. KFence uses a sampling interval to determine whether to apply guards to a memory allocation. When the sample interval is reached, the next memory allocation made will be guarded and the sample interval is reset. A guarded memory allocation requires additional page table entries, one page of memory for the allocation itself and a guard page either side of it. The actual memory allocation is made either at the beginning or the end of its page. The remainder of this page is not used for other allocations, but is filled with known patterns to enable detecting incorrect writes into this area. Other underflows or overflows will be caught by the guard pages. KFence will not detect every memory safety error, as not every allocation will be guarded. An individual kernel is very unlikely to apply guards to a given memory allocation. However, with enough systems running it, code paths which cause errors will get exercised with guards applied to those allocations, identifying bugs. A common technique in kernel exploitation was to overwrite the user mode address limit value. This was used by the kernel to check whether an address provided by user mode via a syscall is allowable or safe to access, i.e. whether it was a user mode address. Addresses below the limit are okay, addresses above the limit are not. If the address limit could be overwritten by minus one, the kernel would think that it was okay for user mode to access the entire address space, including kernel memory. Having overwritten the address limit using an exploit, to read kernel memory from user mode, a pipe would be created. Next, a write syscall to the pipe using a kernel memory address for its buffer would copy from the desired kernel memory into the pipe's buffer. This would be followed by a read syscall to read the data from the pipe buffer and place it into the given user mode buffer. A similar two-step process can be used to write to kernel memory. The write syscall writes data into the pipe's buffer, then the read syscall reads from the pipe into a kernel address. This exploitation technique was mitigated using ARM's user access override bit. UAO changes the behavior of the LDTR and STTR instructions when they are used by the kernel to perform memory copy operations. For example, those required by read-write syscalls in the technique just given. If the UAO bit is set, then the instructions behave as privileged load store and cannot access user memory. If the UAO bit is clear, the instructions are unprivileged and cannot access kernel memory. So whichever state the UAO bit is in, one of the read or write operations will fail and the attacker cannot access kernel memory using this technique. This can be worked around using the return to BPF technique described earlier. Address limit protection has also changed in more recent versions of Linux, resulting in the removal of this configuration option. From the explanation of the exploitation earlier, you may remember the sequence file structure was used. Overlapping event FD context and sequence file allowed Xingyu to use the sequence file structure's sequence operation member as the event FD context structure's count member and therefore leak kernel memory addresses. Later on in the exploitation process, overwriting sequence operations was used to demonstrate control of the instruction pointer. Sequence file has been used in many Linux kernel exploits. Moving it into a dedicated cache would obviously make the techniques mentioned stop working, as it would not be possible to confuse structure types. Control flow integrity tries to make sure that indirect calls and functions go where they are supposed to. Without this, attackers can hijack the control flow of a program, or in this case the kernel, by changing function pointer addresses or return addresses. CFI is implemented for Android using Clang, and is performed at the final link stage so all information is available regarding function addresses and their callers. This does somewhat increase the link time when building the kernel image. For indirect calls, the compiler essentially inserts a check on the target address just before the call happens. If the target address is not in the list of allowed addresses for that call site, the kernel panics. As shown on the slide, in this case, trying to use the modified sequence file operations would have been detected. So an alternative way to execute return to BPF would have been required. CFI usage in Android has been increasing each year as more OEMs enable the feature in their kernels. 
CFI is also used in the generic kernel image project. So as newer Android devices start shipping with GKI kernels, CFI support across Android will continue to increase. This kernel configuration setting causes BPF to always use the just-in-time compiler. The BPF instruction interpreter itself is not compiled with this setting enabled, so it is not present in the kernel image. As Xingyu demonstrated earlier, if the BPF interpreter is present, then having control of the instruction pointer and some arguments allows it to be called to execute arbitrary BPF instructions without them having gone through the verifier. This blocks the return to BPF technique that was used to bypass other mitigation techniques. The final kernel mitigation, config debug list, is another one recommended by Project Zero, this time by Maddie Stone, which is also now required for Android. After an operation on a linked list element, the forward and backward pointers are checked to ensure that the links between elements in the list are valid. This means that list corruption is detected as it occurs which would stop the techniques described earlier from being used. So there are a number of mitigations which could have, and in some cases actually did block various parts of the exploit. Some of these were encountered on devices during development of the exploit, and these were able to be worked around. Multiple mitigations that together block all parts of the exploitation techniques described here are required now on Android. So other vulnerabilities in the future will require different methods. Now we'll talk about some of the other ways we protect Android users. Starting with on-device protection, Android's application verification feature is something you may be familiar with. When an app is sideloaded, for example, the verifier will check to see if it's known to be malware. As well as checking for specific APKs, this also looks at the similarity of the APK on device. Information about known bad applications for the similarity check is provided by Google servers. This is to handle small differences in an APK's contents, which would defeat hash comparisons, for example. This covers the case where a side-loaded application contains a local privilege elevation exploit to support malicious activities. Advanced protection is an opt-in system that most visibly enables two-factor authentication and restricts app installations to a subset of those available on Google Play. Sideloading is disabled and cannot be enabled. Limiting the pool of apps that can be installed makes users less likely to encounter malware. Moving to server-side analysis, we have a lot of infrastructure analyzing Android applications. All applications are constantly reanalyzed so that any new detection rules or analysis systems are applied to everything over time. We use static analysis to generate information from APK contents and dynamic analysis to run the app in an instrumented environment to get information about what it does. We inspect packers and obfuscators to support better static analysis. The graph here shows the proportion of malware apps that are protected by different packers. Data like this shows trends in the ecosystem and allows us to identify changes in packer popularity, which can indicate that there's a new packer available, for example. The long-term objective of any analysis work that we do is to automate the process of extracting new information or performing additional detection based off what we learned. Static analysis scales better than dynamic analysis, but it can be difficult to understand what's happening. The image on the left here shows the control flow for a very simple exploit sample, CVE 2016-5195. The characteristic mAdvise and seek write loops are easy to see. On the right is a different larger exploit, and the middle image shows an obfuscated function as displayed by IDA, which is considerably harder to understand. Dynamic analysis lets you see what the code actually does, provided you can get it to run and perform its malicious actions. Exploits are generally straightforward in that they try to exploit the device. There may be checks for whether the device is supported, particularly if the exploit needs known memory addresses or offsets and cannot derive these at runtime, but these can always be knocked out if you don't mind the risk of crashing your test device. Routing exploits generally need to interact with the OS. Obviously, if an exploit needs a certain device driver, you have to have the right device to run it on. If you can see what the exploit asks the kernel to do, then you can start to understand what's happening. eBPF, one of a number of tracing and monitoring systems for Linux 
allows monitoring of kernel calls and the parameters they are given, which will show any suspect behavior. The exploit described by Xingyu relies on kernel heap sprays to control use after freeze by manipulating kernel heap layout. Heap sprays are typically performed by allocating and releasing large numbers of particular objects, for example, files or sockets. The technical paper covers the behavioral detection example in more detail than we have time for now, so please take a look at that. On the left, we can see the start of the output from Xingyu's exploit. On the right, we can see output from the trace at about the same time. At this point, you can see 25,000 calls to EventFD, which is not normal behavior for an Android application. The next thing that happens is every second EventFD handle is closed, which is again unusual behavior. The suspicious behavior continues in similar fashion. The exploit launches threads to perform more memory manipulation work. This exploit has to perform these actions. So if we can see them or similar happening, we can see it. Interleaving these required actions with garbage calls might help disguise the activities, but could affect timing and hence exploit reliability. And we may be able to identify and ignore garbage calls as well. Xingyu encountered a number of problems developing the exploit, but with a lot of work, heap manipulation and help from other people, he overcame them. The workarounds were themselves defeated by further mitigations, which you can find on current Android devices. We mentioned the generic kernel image project. This means kernel updates get onto user devices faster as there is less effort involved across the Android ecosystem in updating kernels, resulting in better protection for Android users. Thank you to two people without whom this work would not have happened. Jan Horn for discussing exploitation techniques, suggesting workarounds for mitigations and more mitigations for the workarounds, and ZY Joe for donating his MI9 phone for exploit development and testing. Finally, thank you for watching this presentation.